chapter 2. I'm going to try something today. I want, I want to read to you, and then we'll comment on what we're reading. Because uh, there's a message in all of this that blows me away. Luke, the second chapter. And I'll start with verse 1. In the days Caesar Augusta issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinus was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own hometown to register. This is where the Scripture says in Galatians, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son. The fullness of time was the worst of times, and yet it was full. It was the perfect time for God to send forth his Son. This was a taxation on everyone, and it didn't matter. You could not send out a, an exemption because you were eight and a half months pregnant. You had to go. So this forced Joseph and Mary to go to the town in which they came, Bethlehem. And, of course, the Old Testament tells us that Bethlehem was the town in which Jesus would come from. So all of these things had to take place. You, you, to, to understand the miracle of Christmas Day is to look at all the things that God had to set in place to make happen. And this was one of them. A taxation went out, and so they all had to go there to pay taxes. Now, at that time, you could pay taxes with an animal or animals. You could pay it with, with finances, but they had to go and, and make sure they took care of their taxes. So Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house in the line of David. And when, of course, you speak of David, you speak of the Old Testament David, amen, that Jesus would come from the seed of David. It would come all the way through. The, that's why we marvel when David got with Bathsheba and you said to yourself, well, that was a terrible mistake. And yet it was through Bathsheba that God hid the seed so Satan couldn't find the seed. This is important because God hid the seed of David, amen, to get Jesus here. That's why you had the death of all the children that took place because Satan has been trying to stop Genesis chapter 3 which is the seed of God would crush the head of the serpent. So this is all prophetic as it moves through Scripture. So Joseph went up to the house. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. As she gave birth to her firstborn, a son, she wrapped him in clothes, placed him in a manger because there was no room for Jesus in the end. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. They were terrified. But, but the angel said to them, hey, don't, 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 don't be afraid. Well, then don't show up like that, and I won't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people today in the town of David, which is Bethlehem. A Savior has been born to you. He's Christ, the, the Lord. The word Christ, there were a lot of uh, Jesuses in the day. Uh, Barabbas was a Jesus. Bar Abba, son of, son, Bar means son, Abba, father, son of the father. Barabbas was a, was a Jesus. A lot of Jesuses in the day, but there were no Christ Jesus. Christ speaks of prophet, priest, and king. It, preaks, it speaks of the anointed one. So when it says that there's Christ being born there, the Lord, this will be a sign to you. You're going to find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. They couldn't send a text. They had to have a sign. And the sign was, don't, don't go to the hospital. Don't go into the Holiday Inn. Go into the barn. And there in the barn, you'll find baby Jesus wrapped, laying in a stall in a stable. So they went there. Suddenly, a great company of Heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying. So the first angel got there first, and the rest of the angels showed up second. They were a little slower. When they got there, they were all shouting, Glory to God, amen, in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. Then the angels had left them and gone into heaven. The shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told them about. So they were obedient. They heard the angels say it. They didn't just sit there. They took off. So they hurried off and found Mary, Joseph, and the baby who was lying in a manger. Then they had seen him. They spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. Now, I want to stop here just a second and tell you, first thing they did when they found out about this miracle is they spread the word. Everybody say spread the word. Come on, say it again. 
They spread the word. One of the great things about understanding the word of God is once it gets inside of you, you've got to spread the word. And I told you that it's a wonderful life. And my life has been wonderful because I've been able to spread the word. And I love spreading the word. I love sharing the word. And over 40 years now, I've been, I've been all, in so many countries sharing the word. But I read this out of 2 Timothy 2.2 2, that says, And the things you have heard me say, this is Paul speaking, say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Now, Mike, this is on the overhead somewhere. You find it, it's there, okay? Amen. So spread the word about this child. So they begin to spread the word, and this is what Paul did. He would spread the word about, word about Jesus. And Paul said, I, I shared it with reliable people. To, you, to me, you're reliable. And I can tell you about the word and what Jesus has done, and I ask you to take it to Lubbock and back to wherever Texas you're from, and amen, wherever you live. Spread the word about him. So it went like this, that Paul shared it with Timothy, his spiritual son, amen, who was able to share it with reliable people, faithful men who were qualified to share up to others. 2 Timothy 4.17 says, But the Lord stood by my side and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it, and I was delivered from the lion's mouth. When Paul spoke of this, he was saying, that you know what, at first we think this word was only to the Jews, but it's also to the Gentiles. Can I get an amen? And we were grafted in. God, we got the same blessings as the Jews or anyone else. We are the children of God. Amen. God, he put us in, he adopted us. Yeah. Put us inside there, amen, that we might win souls. The scripture tells us, that if you win souls, you're wise. So when they went out, they began to spread the word. They got the word that Jesus was born. They went and they saw the baby, and then they went out and began to spread it. Now, this is what happened. Amen. So for 30-something years before Jesus started his ministry, the word was being spread that this Christ child is growing. God is here. When you read, heard the song, Mary, did you know? Mary, did you know that he's going to walk on water? He was going to raise the dead. He was going to do all these. Did you know? She had to know something. Amen. And when she kissed him, she kissed the face of God. Isaiah 7, 14 says, therefore, the Lord himself is going to give you a sign. Again, seven, eight hundred years before Jesus showed up, that a virgin will be with a child. It ain't happened since. We've not had any virgin birth since. Amen. It, we with a child and give birth to a son. So not just a baby, but a boy. And his name be called Emmanuel, was be God with us. It's going to happen in, in Bethlehem, the book of Micah, chapter 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans. That's what I always love about Crosby. When I first came here 30-something years ago, it was a small town. There wasn't nothing going on in this town. Amen. I mean, it was someplace you drive by. Now we got chicken filet. God has blessed this town. Can I get an Amen. Amen. But a little bit of town, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler of Israel, whose origins from old. In other words, he been since way before time. I mentioned to you last week that John the Baptist said, before I was born, he was. And John was actually older than Jesus. And yet he said, before I was, Jesus showed up. Galatians 4, 4, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. Amen. Why did he do it? Galatians 4, 5, to redeem those who are under the law. He showed up to redeem us, to buy us back. To redeem means to get back again. So he bought us back again. Let's keep reading the word here. But Mary treasured up. I love this. Verse 34. Verse, excuse me. Verse 19. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. Mary, did you know? To store them up. Why would they spread the word about this baby? What is the thing about this baby? The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Verse 21, on the eighth day when it was time to circumcise him, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he had been conceived. Yeah, so he had to go be circumcised. Eighth day. Did you know that science have proved that on the eighth day, the blood count of a, a young boy is at the lowest point, and when you cut him, he will bleed the least? So on the eighth day, all the children, eighth also speaks of new beginnings, starting over. So on the eighth day, they kept the law that was there, and they brought him to the temple. Now, God had a plan. Everybody say a plan. Because on that eighth day, there were two people there in church waiting on them. One's name was Simeon. And the other one was named Anna. 
And so on that eighth day, when the time of their purification, according to the law of Moses, had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord. Do you understand that that is the tithe? The T-I-T-H-E is a tithe. Every firstborn male must be consecrated or given to God. So they would give the firstborn of their sheep. They'd give the firstborn of their goats. They'd give the first of their, of their crops, the first of their money, the 10%. Amen, they would give. So Jesus, watch this, was the tithe of heaven. Amen. And as a tithe of heaven, he was cursed and hung on a tree, and all of our sins were laid upon him. That's why you don't touch the tithe. It belongs to God. Amen. It redeems. It's a redeeming factor in your life. It redeems the 90% you got left. Oh, come on, don't preach me out of this room now. Amen. I'm just reading the Bible to you. All right. Amen. Verse 24, and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. He was looking for the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Wow. Moved by the Spirit, he went to the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles. Remember last week I told you that in the beginning, God said, let there be. Let there be. Amen. Genesis chapter 2, verse 2. Let there be. I mean, chapter 1, verse 2. And then, the, uh, uh, I think it was like verse 12, the Bible says, then God created the sun and the moon. So God created light before there was a sun and moon. See, we can't wrap our finite minds around that because in our mind, the only light there is is the sun and the moon. But when God said, let there be light, it was the Word. In the beginning was the Word. John said, chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. And the Word was with God. The Word of God is the light. Amen. It brings men out of darkness. It creates a, a, a beauty in the women. Amen. It's something about the light of God. So he said, I saw the light of salvation. There was something about it. Light has always been. When God spoke, there was light. When you get to heaven, there will be no more sun, no more moon, for he will be the light. Amen. You're not going to go to sleep. The preaching will be better up there. Amen. A light for revelation to the Gentiles for the glory of your people. Another little tidbit real quick. She wrapped him, King James says, in swaddling clothes. The word swaddling is what you use to wrap a stick with, to light it, to put on a post. Amen. She wrapped him like a light. Amen. He was the light of the world. Oh, that's good preaching. Where were you, Jerry? Okay. Verse 33. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed him and said to Mary, his mother, this child, come on, come on, do something good. You know, how, how many of you, lift your hand if I've dedicated your children. Throw your hand up. I've dedicated you. See, that's how old I am now. And, and, and some of you, I've dedicated children's children. Amen. Now, hear me. When I'm praying over your kids, you're listening. I know you are. And you think, what, what, what's he going to say? What's he going to say? Amen. Hopefully something good. And, and usually, God will give me a little word or something. I'll, I'll say something nice. And so, but at this moment, he holds up baby Jesus. Amen. He gets baby Jesus in the air, and he, and he looks over at them, and, and, he, and he says to them in Luke chapter 14, amen. Where am I at here? i got to find it. There it is. Verse 34. Then Simeon blessed him and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword, mama, will pierce your own soul. Well, thank you a lot. 
What did you just say? You just told me that this baby boy is going to cause a falling and a rising. This child is going to split families. This, this child is going to pierce my heart. One day I will watch his crucifixion, and, he, and it will destroy. It, was, it will pierce me. It will divide me. My tears will flow. I will see the death of my own son. That's what you're telling me, sir? Yes, ma'am. Let me tell you, that's what I'm saying to you. See, his birth, he showed up in the shadow of the cross. And Simeon began to share about it. Amen. And began to lay it out. Hallelujah. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them. This child is destined to cause this. Amen. And there was also, I'll get to Anna in a minute. But let, let me mention to you very quickly. I'm going to move through this fast, Mike. But the, there's a cost to serving him. There's a cost to serving the Christ. Amen. The book of uh uh, Luke chapter 14, verse 25 says, One day when a large group of people were with Jesus, walking along with him, he turned and told them, Anyone who comes to me but refuses to let go of father, mother, spouse, children, brothers, sisters, yes, even one's own self, you can't be my disciple. I pondered that when I first got born again because I thought to myself, God, surely you didn't come and tell me to divide myself from my mom, my dad, my brother, my sister. Surely you didn't tell me that they was going to cost me this. And there was a time that I remember I loaded up my old Dodge Charger and threw a sleeping bag in the back, and I slid down Wheeler Mountain in an in a icy storm because I couldn't stay on the mountain any longer. Uh, there were too many vices for me to get in trouble with, and I went and stayed and slept on the floor of a parsonage in the cold of the winter in North Alabama. And I realized at that moment that it was happening, that I was being divided. And though I love my mom, my dad, and my, my family, there was a division coming that I couldn't keep doing what I was doing. I couldn't keep the drinking and, and the partying and the, the life that I'd led. I, uh, something had happened in my spirit. And I realized that Jesus was talking about me becoming a disciple, amen, and walking with him and going from believer to disciple to be more like Christ. And that dividing place came. I read that anybody, any personal goals that I had, at that time I, I had just a, actually I'd quit college and things of that nature. I didn't know what I was going to do in life. But, you know, you always have goals you want, you want to do in life. And then I read the Scripture, anyone who won't shoulder his own cross and follow behind me can't be my disciple. If, there is, uh, if anyone hear this, planning a building, a new house, doesn't first sit down and figure the cost so you know if you can complete it. If you only get the foundation laid and then run out of money, you look like a, a laughingstock and foolish. You started something you couldn't finish. Or can you imagine a king going into battle against another king without first deciding whether it's impossible that he, with 10,000 troops, to face 20,000 troops to another? And if he decides he can't, won't he send an emissary to work out a truce? In other words, when you start serving God, you've got to count the cost. You know, there are times I want to tell people, you know, probably best for you just going to hell because you can't do this thing. You've got to decide in your heart you can, and you've got to press on into it. There was personal possessions. Jesus said, simply put, if you're not willing to take what is dearest to you, whether plants or people, and kiss it goodbye, you cannot be my disciple. And I think of life, and I realize what he was saying. Unless your love for me is so great that it makes everything else look small, you're not going to make it. I got to love my family, but I got to love him more. I got to appreciate my possessions, but I got to love him more. Everything's about loving him more. If he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. That's a hard word. And I'm not here to tell you to backslide, walk away from God. I just want you to think about it. You know, serving God comes with a cost. And Jesus laid it out. We often won't talk about it. But on this day, I want to tell you that there's a cost to serving him. And I've laid things down. My pastor told me today, he said, when I told him it's a wonderful life, I thank God for you that you were born. He said, oh, you got to hear my pastor. You know my pastor. Oh, little buddy, I'm so glad you came into this world. You taught me to be a giver. Now, there's an older man, 10 years older than me, he told me I, you taught me to be a giver. Amen, to learn to let go of things and not let things on you. And I, I, I hold on to that because that's one of the things in my life that I've learned to do. Because I said, Pastor, I've lost so many things so quickly, but I found out that God always gives it back. Amen. He blessed me so many times, so many times over. I've gotten things back through floods and loss of life. In my li yeah, things in my life, I've learned it. Amen. You, you'll get it back in Jesus' name. Amen. Committed individuals, individuals, individuals who follow this child live with the expectancy to see change. And the more you grow with God, it's not a bad thing to let go of. By the way, 
I got my mama back, my daddy back, my brother back, my sister back. I got all my friends back. Amen. I, I ended up seeing them come to Jesus. They all got, well, I, I baptized them. Amen. I've already buried my sister and my dad. And, amen. And, and, the, and the coin tosses up whether I'll go before my mama or not. But here's the deal with Simeon. Simeon said, I will not leave this world until I have seen him. And then he held him and prophesied over him and gave God back to his mother. He said, he's going to cause a rising and a falling among many. He's going to pierce your heart, but this is the way it's got to be. That moment, to me, he said, now I can go in peace. You realize this man wanted to die, but he made himself a promise that he would not until he saw Jesus, and then he could go in peace. You know how many of us try to hold on, hold on, hold on? And Simeon had the flip side to it. He said, I, I'm ready to go. Amen. I'm ready to be with Jesus. Now, you can cut me loose now. Now, there's Anna. Then this Anna shows up. Is this okay? A little different, huh? I like it. There was also a prophetess named Anna, the daughter of Phanel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She lived with her husband seven years, and after her marriage, and then was a widow until she was 84. In other words, for 44 years, her, she was only married seven years. Her husband died. She's now widowed for 44 years. And was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. Then Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord. They returned to Galilee to their own town. Joseph, if you come up. Coming up to them, at that moment, she gave thanks to God. Thank you, Jesus, for Jesus and all who were looking forward to the redemption of this child. She laid out a fact that he came to redeem us. She knew it. Amen. There was, a, there was an excitement about her life. I want to tell you a little bit about Jesus real quick. I'm going to verse 40 here. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. I don't know what your Jesus looks like, but when I read the Bible, I see him in my mind's eye. He wasn't a pansy Jesus. He no sissy about Jesus. Wasn't a wussy. He's strong. He's a carpenter's son. He lived outdoors. Amen. He hung out in the woods. He understood. I've often said when God created man, he created him in the wilderness. Amen. And men love to go to the wild, don't they, H? Amen. The women he created in the garden. Women like to tend to stuff. Say amen, sir. You know it's true. She tend to stuff. She t Without her, your life be a mess. She always tending to stuff. She makes sure everything's good, taken care of. She's a gardener. Amen. But you, sir, you're a little wild. You like the hot rod. You like the hunting. You like being outside. You like the fishing. You like lying about what you caught. Yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. He wasn't a plastic Jesus. He was real. He wasn't something you put on your dash and worshiped and looked at. It wasn't something you hung around your neck and thought you were religious about it. Nothing plastic about Jesus. He wasn't partial. He wasn't half God and half man. He was all man. God lived in him. He was God himself. He learned to put his godness aside. He had to be careful what he said, because when he spoke, things happened. When he yelled at the cemeteries, things came alive. Amen. It's, an, it's amazing. The thought still runs through my mind near his crucifixion in Gethsemane. There at Gethsemane, when they came to him and they asked him who he was, he said, I am. And when he said, I am, it's close to a cemetery. You can find it in the, I think it's in the book of Mark, where a young man came up out of the grave there. He had no clothes on him. He had linen on him. And they pulled the linen away from him when he reached toward Jesus. It's one of them little scriptures I mentioned to you a while back. I found, a, I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit more during Easter, but it amazed me that when he spoke, things happened. How, why is that young man with linen on? Why did they pull the linen? He would run away naked because that's how they buried people. And he came up from the grave and he reached toward the Savior at that moment. Oh, 
Stuff you ain't going to hear in other churches. That's why you need to be in this house. Amen. I'll tell you stuff that's in this here book. I'll, I'll speculate and try to tell you something I can't prove, you can't disprove. Amen. But here he was. He wasn't a pink Jesus. The last slide I saw of Mary and Joseph, they had dark skin. You know, us Americans, we think he's blue-eyed, brown-haired. And he was dark-skinned. He was Jewish. He came to a group of people to connect with them. And whatever race you are, he connects with you. Amen. When we see him, we might be a little shocked. No, we won't be shocked. I, I really don't care. I don't. If he's black, red, yellow, white, polka dot, purple, I'd be that would bother me. But <laughs> if he wore a jacket like that. Jesus was a Jew that radically departed from the prejudice of the past. He dwelt among a, a racist people and taught them to love Samaritans and all people. He healed Roman centurions, the servant, the Canaanite woman's daughter. He talked to a Samaritan at the well. Followers of Jesus got to be like him, not in pigmentation, or racial characteristics, but accepting and loving all people. There was no room for him at the end. Today you made room for Jesus. You said, today's not an inconvenience to me. I want to be in church. Amen. You, you said today, I'm not so busy. I'm not so busy that I can't take an hour and a half and go to church. You said that to yourself today when you showed up. You had an expectation today during worship. Amen. You had an expectation of the goodness of God in the land of the living. You were looking. Just like Simeon, you were looking. Like Anna, you were looking. We look through the eyes of faith, not fact. Amen. You know, fact living, I've got to see it to believe it. That, that was Thomas. Faith living says, I got to believe it before I see it. Hear that again. I got to believe it before I see it. I got to believe it. Last week I told you, and I'm still going to do it. I'm going to get a box, and I'm going to put in that box a coat. I'm going to put in that box a pair of shoes. I'm going to put in that box a ring. And when the prodigals of my life come home, I'm going to give them that coat, them shoes, and that ring. And I'm going to thank God for bringing the prodigal back. See, the prodigal's father fatted up a calf. He said, I'm going to believe it before I see it. And he fatted up a calf before the boy ever came home. you got to keep believing. Amen? If you keep believing, you'll keep seeing it. Hallelujah. One who believes needs no sign. I believe it. And even when discouraged, keep, look, look, keep looking. Luke 2, 26, that he would, not be, he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. There had been no fresh word. Listen, from the book of Malachi to the book of Matthew, 400 years had passed of silence. When God said not a word, 400 years. Slavery had come back into lives of the Israelites. Abuse. Darkness had covered the land. Time of wickedness. And in the fullness of time, God spoke through the darkness and sent his son wrapped in swaddling clothes to a little town in Bethlehem to a virgin girl and a man who dignified her it would not put her away. Amen. The assurance comes before the answer. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. Let me pray with you. This baby's been changing the world for a long time. This baby's still changing the world. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, I don't know how you are on this uh, Christmas day, so I'm going to ask you just one question. This child's going to cause a falling and a rising in your life. He's going to cost you to serve God. For some of you, certain relationships you're not going to have in 2023 that you've had because it's going to cost you. You can't keep running with the same bunch of dogs. 
you got to change it up. God's speaking right now that your playmates, playground, and playthings got to change if you're going to change. And you say, Pastor, I, I, I know there's got to be a change. I ain't saying I'm vaccinated. I ain't saying I'm away from God. But I'm telling you, there got to be some changes in my life. And I realize this child will cause a falling and a rising in my life. But he also has brought forth redemption. You don't have to look around. Your heads are bowed. But just very quickly, put your hand up and back down. If that's you I'm talking to, my God, you look at the building. Hands back down. I don't want people on the cameras to see you. But I see hands all over the place. This is going to be a year of redemption and repentance. Things turning around in our life. So on this Christmas day, let's give God the best gift we can. That's the gift of ourselves. So we pray this together. Lord Jesus, I give you me. I give you me. That's all I got to offer. I thank you for the gifts and the benefits you've blessed me with. Forgive me for being half-hearted, for thinking I could live any way I wanted. You said it doesn't work that way. So take my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Turn me around. In Jesus' name, amen. Now give God a good praise. Amen. Hallelujah. Merry Christmas, church. Amen. In front of you is a tithe and offering envelope. Give your tithe and your offering today. Those that are watching online, you know you can go to holywild.net slash give. Amen. And give on this day. I thank you for your prayers. I'll, I'll be leaving right after church today to head to Colorado. Up to 87. Amen. To go see my grandkids and bring them some gifts. And I hope to God that grandson doesn't know I'm coming yet because he will wear me out on the phone on the way there. Amen. If I get our servant leaders to come up. If, you got, uh, if you're giving on your phone when they pass by, just hold your phone up to them. Just say, I'm giving on my phone today. Amen. I'm giving that way. Also, in, in the bookstore, uh, Lucinda, there are some... Uh, you know, it's finally come down to this. There were times we would put out cards of my family and to be the grandkids and the dogs and all that. Now it's just down to me and Lori. Hey, man, they've all have departed and gone to other places, and they get, they sending out their own postcards. But if you'd like a postcard of, of Lori and I, Merry Christmas, hey, man, it's in the back. You can take it and put it on your refrigerator. To remember to keep praying for us. Um, so uh, that's back there. You're welcome to take that. And I say, again, Merry Christmas. You're a gift to this man. I appreciate this house and all that you've done for me and my family and for our staff uh, on behalf of uh, Josiah and Joseph and David and those that work out at the ranch. We appreciate you guys, man. I mean, when they get up and they tell you they appreciate they mean it. I mean, they speak of you throughout the week. Uh, we talk of this church. Uh, you know, we don't do great productions in here. I quit that a long time ago. I like the simplicity. To the families that came today, thanks for coming. Amen. And if you're able to come back, and if you don't have a home church and you feel good about this place, show up, pray up, and give up. Amen. This would be your house. Uh, we're looking forward to a great year next year, 2023. Mind-blowing, man. Mind-blowing to get to this place. Stephen, love you guys. Glad for you guys getting back in your new house. Look forward to coming out there and praying over that house. Amen. Hallelujah. Pastor David, if you'd come. As we give today, we're believing God for jobs and better jobs. More money, less hours, benefits, sales and commission, checks in the finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates, debts demolished, favor. Amen.